Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, to make this life count, and to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Today on my show, I'm thrilled to be interviewing Joel and Christy Peed from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I love this couple, and this couple has made a huge, huge difference in my life, especially over the last five years. Joel and Christy have been married for 24 years. They've got three kids who are all strong disciples, and they're in the process of adopting a great niece and another small child, which we'll talk about. Joel has a master's degree in biblical studies. They've been in the ministry for 27 years. They were on staff in the Minneapolis church for 10 years. They led the Omaha, Nebraska church from 2002 to 2006. And they witnessed God grow the church through uh, the early 2000s. They planted the Chippewa Valley Church of Christ, which is in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. That's E-A-U-C-L-A-I-R-E. In 2006, they started with five people. God grew it to 115. And then they planted another church from that planting to Duluth. And so they're really an amazing couple. They started this, the North American Small Church Leadership Committee with Pam and myself with a goal to encourage and inspire small church leaders of the ICOC. Right now, they're starting a new ministry, if that weren't enough, the Waters of Rest ministry designed to help ministers and their families experience spiritual health and renewal through implementing Sabbath rhythms and sabbaticals. But before we get into this week's episode, I want to let you know about a new mission planting. The churches in Arizona are working together to plant a church in Flagstaff, Arizona, next summer, the summer of 2021. I've been asked to form the team and train its leader. I'm looking for a leadership couple who would like to to go and lead that planting. And so if you're interested, I'd like you to contact me. Also, I'm looking for team members. If you're a married couple, retired, if you are single, a campus person who wants to transfer, this is an awesome opportunity to make your life count and make disciples. Flagstaff is a beautiful, beautiful city. It's an area of around 139,000 people. It's forested at 7,000 feet. It's only two hours away from the Grand Canyon. It's a gorgeous, if you like skiing, hiking, outdoor activity, four seasons, It's only two hours away from Phoenix. Amazing, amazing place. So we're looking for short and long-term missionaries. Uh, If you can work remotely, it'd be a great opportunity for you. I'm Again, I'm specifically looking for a couple who'd like to be trained for that mission position to lead that planting. That person would move to Tucson first to get personal training and discipling from Pam and myself. And so please contact me. It's going to be an awesome, awesome planting. Very exciting. You can reach me at rob at tucsonchurchofchrist.org, rob at tucsonchurchofchrist.org, or you can reach me through Facebook or my website, robskinner.com. Back to the program. Joel and Christy, welcome. Great to have you on the program. Thank you so much, Rob, for having us. We want to go to Fleet Staff. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it'd be fun to go together. Now, I, <laughs> I got to show you, you guys are an amazing couple, and um the thing that I, I really appreciate, Joel, about you is you are such a giving person, and both you and Christy are such an amazing couple. You're so kingdom-minded. And um, why don't we just go ahead? I'll, I'll, I want to share more about you, but why don't you guys share first about how did you guys become Christians? Uh, well, as the song goes, I was looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> As a young single professional, I had just graduated from college and moved to Minneapolis and was teaching there and uh, had experienced another devastating breakup. And I distinctly remember laying on the floor, crying to God, asking him, why was he doing this to me? And within that week, a disciple that I worked with at the school invited me to church. I went out that Sunday in Minneapolis and some sisters asked me to study the Bible. And uh, about two and a half weeks later, I was baptized. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, I became a disciple in 1992. So I was in halfway through college at the University of Minnesota. 
Uh, and, you know, I'd grown up uh, going to church. My dad was actually a preacher. And, uh, but, you know, really strayed, uh, never was really, you know, wholehearted growing up and then really strayed the first half of college and had just decided that that wasn't working either. That's st lifestyle. And so I just had the thought like, you know, I should probably find a church up here in Minneapolis because I'm not going to be going home anymore. And then right then uh, a brother reached out to me and uh, almost uh, late at night in a grocery store, came up behind me, tapped on my shoulder <laughs> and uh, asked me about coming to church. And I was a little taken aback, to be honest. And so he asked me to church. I, I, I gave him my information, but I didn't really come to church, didn't really come to Bible talk. But then he asked about a singles. He's like, well, we have a singles event. And so I was all over that and came to this singles event, a lot of great people there, a lot of good looking ladies. And I was like, I need to come to this church. So went to church the next day and uh, was baptized a few weeks later. So. That's awesome. Okay. So then you're in the ministry for a while. How did you guys meet? How did you guys get connected, get married? Well, it actually started the brother who had reached out to me was not doing well spiritually and left the church for a while. And, um, we were at a baptism and Joel, I was there, Joel was there and he approached me and said, you know, how are you doing with so-and-so who's left the church? You know, how is this affecting you? Are you okay? And um, little did he know that I already had had my eye on him oh. <laughs> because of a sermon he had preached. I was very inspired. And then when he talked to me, I thought, oh my gosh, he talked to me. And I went home and told my roommate. And so she's like, oh, we need, you need to write him a thank you note. And so I wrote him a thank you note. And uh, I'll let Joel go from there. I had never gotten a, as incredible a thank you note for a fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like, this is an incredible sister. So, yeah, we just uh, went on some dates and fell in love. And the rest is history. Wow. Wow. So, so Chrissy, what was it about Joel that you liked so much? Uh, his passion when yeah. he preached, he was so zealous for God and I love that. Yeah. Yeah. He was tall. He's tall too. What do you, Joel, you're like he six, four. Tall was very high on my priority list. <laughs> Handsome. <laughs> funny, <laughs> athletic. Well, we gotta insert some truth into this, Rob. The first time she met me, she was not impressed at oh, all. Yeah, that's <laughs> sure, she was like, this guy is not cool. Uh, but so, so finally, you know, I, I preached and then she took notice. So <laughs> yeah, now very humbling. You, one thing that I noticed <laughs> immediately when, when I met you guys and I still hear it today is you guys have a very distinct Northern Midwest accent <laughs> you betcha <laughs> yeah i mean you you sound like characters uh straight out of fargo or something like that <laughs> now can you just for the benefit of our listeners give us a few phrases or words that, that typify that type of an accent don't you know <laughs> don't you know you betcha yeah <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have some potluck after church, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely sounds a little bit uh, Norwegian or Scandinavian in origin. Norwegian. So Christie's maiden name is Ingebretsen. Oh my gosh, that explains it. Okay, back on <laughs> back on the subject. Now, you guys planted a church. I mean, in the wake of 2003, there was a lot of turbulence in our family of churches. Out of the blue, you decide to plant a church in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. There's a University of Wisconsin there in Eau Claire. But you did decide to do it kind of self-supporting. Can you explain why you did it and what was going through your mind at the time? Sure. Well, um, it really wasn't out of the blue. We had, we had both come from very small towns in the upper Midwest. I was from a small town of about 2,000 people, as was Christy. And so when we became disciples, um, God put it on our hearts in a very young age that we want to see the upper Midwest evangelize. We want to plant churches in these medium-sized towns, and then they would in turn implant churches all over the upper Midwest, specifically Minnesota and Wisconsin. 
And so um, 2003, the Henry Crete letter in, in Omaha, that time really helped us clarify who are we, what do we believe, uh, what should the church look like, and how should we build it? And we got a lot of, we worked with the core group in Omaha, it's an incredible group. And that church actually grew through that time while most of our churches were shrinking. And then in 2005, uh, we just felt like the spirit put on our hearts that it's time. Our oldest son, Jackson, was about to go into kindergarten. And we had three little kids. I think they were like four, two, and eight months when we moved. <laughs> and uh, we just felt like it, it was time. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any people. Uh, and But we, we felt called by God. And so we, we decided to go for it. So, um, yeah, it was really the, the, it was really a time, the time more was not just spur the moment, let's do this, but more like it's time to answer this call, which had been on our hearts for many, many years. Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind, Christy? Uh, well, I had actually been on a private or a personal retreat and in solitude and, after having been away for a couple of days, I, I literally just felt this sense of you need to move back up north and move to Eau Claire and start a church. It was probably the most um, called, I guess, I have ever felt in my life. Mm -hmm. Just this very clear sense of God calling us okay. to move back. Okay, let's, and let's, I came home and I told Joel and he, I think you went on a retreat the I next had, day. I had been gone as well yeah. and had also had this overwhelming sense of following your dream. Hmm. And uh, so I was convinced that that, and then Christy came and shared what she had shared. And so separately, really God, you know, felt like God called us. So it was already affirming as we shared with each other. Okay. The sounds it, that, it sounds a little mystical. Okay. You're, you're talking about feeling called. You went on a retreat. You had a feeling like, you know, for the benefit of our listeners, they're going, okay, wh like what did you, did an angel appear to you? Was there like a voice from heaven? What, what was it? How do you, what does it feel like when you're feeling called? Like, how did you know this is more than just an idea? This is a calling. How, how can you, can you try to describe that feeling? I got some thoughts with you. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a great question. And I honestly hesitate to even share that story because it can sound really mystical, I guess is the word you used. Um, I had been praying and reading my Bible for, you know, a couple days. And it, it really was, it was just this impression on my heart, but I'll let Joel share. Well, I think that um, it is, it is, there's a, a degree of mysticism that is okay. And in our, I think in our tradition, we get nervous about that, but I do think that God can and does put things on our hearts, just like with Nehemiah, et cetera. So I think we get in trouble when we don't get advice, when we're not surrounded in community. So, so from that, we got advice. We worked with the core leaders in Omaha. We actually, you were one of the guys I called for, uh, advice and uh, things just start to resonate. So there's a real peace, there's a calmness, there's a surrenderedness. But then as you take steps, doors start to open and God starts to affirm. And so every step we took was just incredibly affirming, constantly surrendered that this could just be our own idea and not God's. And, and we wouldn't do it, of course. So okay, I think so there's a, there's a, a lot of community individual with God, but also in, in the context of community. So I, we had worked with, we worked with a lot of the Midwest churches and the Heartland churches um, okay. to, to do this together. So it wasn't just one, one retreat. It's, it's a number of different things that keep going back to the same theme. Like, okay, this keeps reaffirming this, this is the direction we should be going in number of different right. circumstances, intuition, feelings, Okay. 
But let me ask. Absolutely, and I think that there's an aspect where you you wanna you wanna let it go. Like, no, like please no. <laughs> and uh, God keeps bringing it, and so. Well, I agree. I agree with that because I remember when I planted a church in my hometown in Ashland, Oregon. That had been something I'd prayed about eighteen years before, but it would come up. The thought of it would come up periodically, and I would think, "I want to get back and do that. I want to get back and do that." And then it just doesn't leave. It's it just it may go dormant for a while. You may not think about it, but it definitely resurfaces. To you, kind of go, "Okay, I better pay attention to this." Um, yeah. what, what advice would you give? Because, you know, sometimes people go, oh my gosh, I'd love to go back and plant a church here in my hometown, but you know, maybe their husband or wife's gone, that's, that's spiritual suicide. You, you shouldn't do that. You know, that's rash. What's the difference between feeling called and feeling like it's just a, a dangerous rash decision? Well, I think definitely being unified with your spouse like if Joel would have been like oh that's crazy we're not doing that then I would have tabled it and kept praying about it and trusted that God would move his heart if you know that's what we were really being called to do Uh, so unity I think in the decision is huge yeah I think just getting lots of advice Mm -hmm. getting lots of advice uh, doing it in community yeah. Uh, is is crucial. Well, uh, so Steve Sainan was one of the first that I called, the leader of the Minneapolis church. And so talking to him and running it by him. So there's a real balance of we're going to follow God. In a way, there's a balance of you got to be convinced that this is of God and not of man. Right. Because if it's of God, it will not fail. If it's of man, it will fail, even if you do a lot of the godly things. Right. And so there is just a personal wrestling spiritually, but at some point you have to trust your walk with God. Right. And there should be a community aspect to that that is affirming. Mm -hmm. For example, if you're running from something or you have a bad attitude towards the preacher or your house church leader or whatever, and you're like, I want to get out of here. I want to go over here. You're running away from something. That's not, right. not a good indication. Um, now, right. why Eau Claire? I mean, most listeners are going, Eau Claire, can't even spell it, let alone find it on a map. <laughs> um, that's not even one of your hometowns is what you've told me. You're not from Eau Claire originally. What did you do? You just pull out a pin and just, you know, blindfold yourself and just go, okay, we're going to, plan a church here why did you choose that place well i think it was a combination christy will share it a minute but i think i think the first part was eau claire is very strategically located in its size and in geography as far as um and if you look at a map of minneapolis and wisconsin it's an hour and a half east of minneapolis so there's a connection to rochester minneapolis duluth st cloud also La Crosse, Wausau, Madison's a couple hours southeast. And so it's it's strategically located as far as being a hub and ascending church. It was like the church in Antioch was not Jerusalem, but Paul kept coming back. And that was our vision from the beginning was that we would be ascending church to uh, plant these other medium-sized towns. And then in combination, Christy's uh, yeah, we had a, or we both had the conviction that we needed to take care of our family. Uh, my parents were much older and in poor health, and I'm the only daughter, and therefore the primary caregiver. And we definitely felt like, okay, it is biblical for us to take care of our physical family. Um, going back to your previous question, even this was a little bit of a test of my heart because there was some questioning, like, oh. So you just want to go to be closer to family, but it actually was the opposite for me. It was probably one of the more um, costs, bigger costs for me to move back to my family because of the, you know, there's challenges that come when you're by your physical family. And so I felt like that was the refining moment of my motives Hmm. to obey the Bible 
and be the daughter I felt like God was calling me to be and count the cost of the sacrifices that would mean for me personally with re-engaging in close proximity to my family. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the cost you had to pay because Christy, you've got three kids at that time, all under the age of five or so. I mean, your household is chaotic, obviously, just based on the, the age of your kids. And then you're going, oh, I'm, I'm, now I'm going to go plant a church. Not in the tree. You didn't, you didn't have any funding when you started. There wasn't someone who called you and said, hey, we're going to give you full support. You had to come up with all your funding. It was a non-traditional planting. So there's not the support. You don't have really a safety net, so to speak. Uh, I, I, I think that's one of the, m- the most common questions that I get from ministers is, how do you do ministry with small kids? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that, Christy? What was going through your mind? And also, how'd you do it? I mean, starting a church, not, it's not hard. It's one of the toughest jobs in the world. Talk a, li- talk a little bit about that, please. Um, one of the stories I would constantly and still constantly rely on is the parable of the fishes and the loaves. One of the convictions we really came through in the early 2000s or came away with was we needed to be less humanistic as a church. And I just, I latched onto that fishes and loaves principle that even if I could just give one fish or one little crumb of bread, that God would do amazing things with that. And in fact, he would do way more than if I had more to give, like, because he's going to get the glory. And we just saw that come true over and over again. And it really built our faith. So going into this, even with now bringing in a four-year-old, it's really cool to see God doing it again, because I feel like my capacity to um, meet with people or to do things is greatly diminished. Um, But my neighbor, my friend just became a Christian. This girl that God arranged to be in our life, who is our full-time babysitter or not full-time, but she is our consistent babysitter is studying the Bible, totally becoming a part of our church and a part of our family. Um, So God is just so faithful, even if we have very little to give. Amen. Wow, Wow, that's an amazing, I mean, we could have a whole section just on that, but I mean, now now you're adding another another child into your family um, under five years old. We'll talk more about that, but I go, oh my gosh. I mean, when I first heard that, I'm like, oh Lord, they're just about free. (laughs) Their kids are just about out of the house. And then 20 more years of hard labor has been handed down to you guys. It's like, wow, you guys are saintly, that's for sure. Um, Going back to this planting, we're going to come back to the whole family issue. I, I really appreciate that example. One of the things that you're gifted with, Joel, is fundraising. And this is something that definitely set your planting apart and you've raised a lot of money. Can you share your approach, your philosophy and what it's produced? Sure. Well, I think fundraising has to, even fundraising can be humanistic. And it really has to start with God's character, that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, Jehovah Jireh, my, my provider, that he will provide and we have to rely on him. Um, so it starts in the character of God, and then it's to continue with prayer, petitioning God. And this is what we, when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, it was a, a few sentences of the Lord's Prayer, but then he told parables about shameless petitioning. Uh, and so I think we, we, we planted the church with the whole basis of, we're gonna, this is going to be a house of prayer. And it was just constant petitioning God in prayer, uh, sending out. We didn't just uh, do form a prayer team. We formed a prayer team. And then I sent them every month specific things to pray for, specific petitions and answered prayers of what we had seen. And so we all say, you know, we believe in prayer, blah, blah, blah. But then we don't petition specifically 
regularly and consistently just the way that uh, Jesus says to do. So I think it has to start with God. Um, we prayed for people of peace to become disciples in Eau Claire. And so very quickly, the church was um, self-sufficient because of the type of people that were becoming disciples in Eau Claire, business owners, doctors, um, and we don't favor the rich, um, but God uses the rich to support his mission, Barnabas. Um, many people it, it, <clears throat> that we see in the New Testament were extremely wealthy gen and generous donors. Um, so there are other disciples that uh, some were asked, we, we would ask for support, and then some gave generously without even being asked. There was this one brother who was sending us $100 a week at the beginning, and I had never met him, didn't know him. He had just heard of what we were doing, stepping out on faith, and he just started sending uh, in addition to his own contribution. And he supported us numerous times. I've still never met him. <laughs> I've tried to, I've tried to meet him and thank him. And he's kind of uh, laying, keeping on the down low. I think <laughs> purposefully. And then, uh, but then some people ask wealthy donors, um, but then also very generous non ICOC people. Um, again, some asked, some unasked. Um, we had a physician come to church a couple times. Um, in Eau Claire, didn't really like church, <laughs> it wasn't really open, uh, but then called me up one day, asked me what I was doing, I said, I'm mowing the yard, he's like, well, I got something for you, wanted to come by, and he gave a check for $6,000, and then he said, and by the way, I want to give, instead of giving our contribution, our church, I want to give to your church, because your church needs it more than our church does, <laughs> and since then, he's been giving a lot of money every month, for years, they've moved to Montana, they've moved to another city in Wisconsin, um, just consistently. So um, so I think many non-ICOC people, you know, when, when God funded the Israelites to leave Egypt, he didn't do a special contribution from amongst the Israelites. He used the Egyptians to fund their mission. Mm. And I think so often when we think of missions, we think of special contribution amongst our people, which is a great source, but it's been probably less than half of, of our own support over many years. Um, Non-ICOC people have, again, some asked, some not asked. Um, so I just think that, that um, thinking outside the box, relying on God, taking risks. So I would say force, there's four specific things that when we do ask, I think are important. Um, spe specific petitioning God in prayer. Second, when you, to, when you ask for a specific amount of money and third, for a specific purpose. So we've asked, so, so I would go to a donor and I would say, if we could raise you know, $25,000, we could purchase this building Here's what we would do with that building. Here's why that building would make a difference. Um, and then have skin in the game. The fourth is to have your own skin in the game. So if I communicate, this is what we want to do, um, and this is why, and then I say, and here's what I'm doing. I'm working three extra jobs, or I'm taking a pay cut, or... Um, my there, wife isn't getting my, paid. <laughs> Christy has never been paid. Um, She's been a volunteer in our um, church. And that's another thing about women's ministries. There's a strong, strong women's ministry. But Christy has been a volunteer uh, since day one in that circle of older women training the younger women. Um, so, but when we communicate, so when we planted the church, between Christy and I, we were working seven jobs. So when I go to a wealthy donor and I say, here's what, if, if we could raise this for this purpose, and here's what we're doing with our own skin in the game, um, they, in, in very surrender, they, sometimes they say, great, I'm happy for you, no thanks, I'm out. But oftentimes they'll be like, you know, here you go, thanks for asking. 
you know, I think a, a huge thing is we, we don't, we can't raise money from people who don't have the money to give. <laughs> we have to go to those who are wealthy. There's so much wealth in this country and um, they're looking for a cause to invest into. And when they have a personal connection and a personal ask that's, that's bold for a, a good cause, and they may not even believe in the cause, but then when they see you believe in it and you got skin in the game and you're willing to sacrifice, um, they're, they can be pretty inspired. So we've raised money. I think this, just to answer your question, we've raised money for staff. We've raised money for buildings. Uh, uh, and we've raised money for personal mission trips. I have one, one little story I want to tell. Um, we we support the churches in Africa and whenever I go on a mission trip overseas I like to take my kids because it's profoundly life-changing but I have them raise their own funds and so this mission trip to Africa was gonna I think it was gonna cost around three three to four thousand dollars and my son Carter was at that time about 14 I think and um he's like I was like, do you want to go with? He's like, yeah, I want to go with. And I was like, well, let's, you know, you can raise the money. And he's like, how am I going to raise the money? And so one night he was just crying. He's like, I so badly want to go to Africa, but I, I only have, he set up a GoFundMe page. I only have $1,200 so far and the deadline's coming up. And just son, I said, son, you just got to trust God. You got to pray. You got to ask God. God will provide. And so he prayed. He was crying. He was praying. He was asking God. And the next morning we got a note in the GoFundMe that said, here's what I'll give. But if there's anything else you need, just let us know the amount. Wow. And to see his faith um, in a God who provides, God will fund his mission um, was, was pretty cool. Okay. You guys have done it. And that brings <laughs> up a, a lot of different issues there. One, um, <laughs> You guys have done a great job with your kids in teaching them about money. I was impressed when I visited there in 2019. Your kids, uh, I mean, you guys live in a very modest house. Um, it's a clean, nice suburban house, but modest by U.S. standards for sure. Um, but your kids are, are extremely, you know, good with money. They've saved up. They bought their own cars and trucks and things like that. And how have you helped teach your kids about money? Obviously, there's one story right there, raising your own funds. What have you done to help your kids deal with the issue of money and, and to be good stewards? Um, well, we, we talk about it, definitely. And we have um, some very wealthy people in our life that we have a lot of great conversations about wealth and how to use it and the ups, you know, the positives and the downfalls of it. So I feel like they've learned a lot through that. Um, but we, we did a class called crown financial ministry, and we've had the kids take that class. We've always expected them to give a contribution. Um, and just getting them involved with the poor, whether it be mission trips or volunteering at the local food shelf here in town, um, talking a lot about why we have money and what it should be for. So I think just talking a lot about it is super important. I think talking about it and then giving them uh, money early on and, and then watching them manage it. So uh, helping them save, helping them spend, giving to God. Um, so, so they, they've all had jobs very early on and then it's their decision what they do with their money. But we talk, we've taught, we talk about first fruits and, and giving first to God. And, and sometimes I ask, we, each month we have a poor contribution. And sometimes I ask my kids, well, what do you get? What did you give? Did you give, you know, not like you better give, but more, what did you give? And I'm literally convicted, like my my son sometimes gives like 50% of his income to the poor. And uh, yet he's got more money in his bank account than, than uh, some disciples I know. So I think it's just <laughs> been real. It's been real that when you, you trust God and give to God and you give to the poor that 
you can't outgive God. And so they've, they've, they've bought their own vehicles and they've just managed their own mm-hmm. finances at an, at an early age. Right. Some of them better than others, of course, sure. <laughs> but, but um, it's pretty cool. It is cool. It's, it's really inspiring. Now let's go back to the earlier discussion about reaching out to those who are well-to-do and building on that. Um, the thought that comes to my mind is, okay, we've got listeners who are listening in from around the world. They're not, they're not from the U S they're not from, um, you know, suburban America. Um, and yet, okay, how can, how can they build a church that includes, you know, people that have means and support? I mean, when I hear that, I go, that's awesome. And yet it's so easy to develop and build a church that's filled with lots and lots of people that are just just barely making it, getting by. So I guess the question is, one, how do you reach that, that segment of the population? I know, it, I know it's not just an American thing because I know that they're doing it definitely in Indonesia and other places as well. They're reaching those who are well-to-do and those who can support the mission. Not that that's our primary goal. But two, for the minister, how do you have the faith? How do you have the faith to believe, okay, I can do this, even if I didn't come from that kind of a wealthy background? I know that's two questions, but. I will share first. I feel super strongly that we have got to be convinced that they need God just as much, no matter how good their life looks on the outside. I think sometimes we can tend to almost be, show favoritism, like reverse favoritism and think, oh, wow, I'm so intimidated by them. And they got their their life together and look at all their toys and, and therefore not reach out to them. And instead of seeing past the outward worldly facade that they put on and realize how desperately they need God just as much and how much they're hurting. Um, like I, this is silly, but we get the newspaper every day and I, every day I read the court reports. I read the divorce reports get put in our paper. And I swear every it's in there every week. I know someone, and these are from all outward appearances, wealthy families, you know, most of the time. And so I think it's just staying in touch with how desperately even the successful people need God and not being intimidated, knowing that, yeah, they may have a lot of money, but you have something so much more to offer them that they need. So not shying away from building relationships with them. You can become their best friend, no matter where or how different you are as far as your income or lifestyle. They don't have true friends. Mm often because of their status. Yeah, I think, I think that, um, well, first of all, I think Jesus said, go find people of peace. When he sent out the 12, he said, go find people of peace and they will, um, they will house you, they will feed you, um, and don't move on from them. And so I think we didn't really think of this um, when we moved to Eau Claire, I met with another church leader and I was like, what, what helped your church grow? And he introduced me to this idea of the, the person of peace. And clearly a person of peace is wide open to the gospel. God has prepared them and they have at least enough wealth to take care of, of the apostles. But then you see the, like I said, the, for example, the Barnabas, the women around Jesus <clears throat> in his ministry provided for his needs uh, material materially. And so I think that it's a biblical principle that we don't want to show favoritism to the rich, of course, in James, in the book of James, but we also don't want to show favoritism the other way and forget that people who have wealth are, they're hurting, they're lonely, they, they need friends. And so often they've put all this identity in their wealth and their friendships are shallow and and so when you when people come along sincere, loving, kind, we never 
we never go like we're gonna go door knock all the rich people in the neighborhood we're just just uh, <laughs> um just kind just try to be kind and caring and they just they just come out of the woodwork you guys are um, definitely kind no doubt about it <laughs> uh so so i would think i do think there's some things in the church that we do that can turn off uh successful people in the world sometimes our meeting places um I'm not saying you have to have a, a an old star gold chandelier in the foyer, but I think we can avoid some things that are that aren't are just a kind of embarrassing, <laughs> that are just a neglectful thing. I think one of the ways we study the Bible with people is we have a very professional uh, study series that's written to the person studying, and we give them we give them the whole pamphlet because we have nothing to hide in our message, and so. Sometimes how we study the Bible with people, people who are intelligent or successful are kind of like, where, where are you headed with this? Like, and in, instead of trying to, you know, surprise them with that at the end, it was just like, hey, here, here's everything we, the fundamentals of what we believe, this is written to you. Um, and I think that that earns trust, that uh, we don't have a hidden agenda here. Uh, so. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. One other thing, last thing I'll say sure. about people of peace is, is put them to work early on. Like it's, it was also, if you came, the joke in our church plans was if you came back a second time, you'd get a job to do. <laughs> and, uh, um, they, you know, we, we really loosen the standards, so to speak of, you know, you have to be this, you know, mature disciple to serve. We had, we had non- disciples doing all kinds of things, ushering and making the bulletins and, you know, s s probably even up on stage playing guitar a couple times. <laughs> yeah, actually, I know that for sure. Uh, so they want to be useful. If God's prepared them, help them be useful with their gifts and talents early on. Mm, that's that's great. a great, great way to engage them. Yeah. I mean, you guys are such a kind couple you you had a you've got such a cozy situation, such a nice situation. Then you, how'd you come up with the idea to help other small churches? This this small church committee that you started. Can you talk about the inception there? Sure. Um, well, I think that uh, the story. I mean, we, again, we've always had this vision and dream. And, but then we were, we were actually asked to lead a, a larger situation. And that process of discerning God's will in that really helped me clarify again, what, what is our calling from God? What is our purpose? What are we made for? Um, and getting a lot of advice in our church, outside our church. And um, it just, it just, you know, over time became pretty clear that we, we're not big church people. <laughs> um, we, we love the small church and um, we love the small town. And so therefore, instead of this church growing and then we just move to a larger church that's probably struggling and needs someone, you know, that's a different gift set or skill set then that's needed in that than just what it takes to build a small church and grow it and so we we didn't necessarily feel like that was our gift set we felt like this is our gift set and so let's multiply this gift set um and so is actually we were having dinner with chris and megan zillman and chris was like well why don't you start we were getting their advice on this and and they were affirming to that and then I said, he's, Chris said, why don't you start a small church conference, small church leadership conference? And that's when I really started to realize when 70% of our churches are under 100. And at the same time, our most efficient uh, growth is happening with churches under 100 in that 40 to 80 range. And I thought, well, maybe that's the sweet spot. So instead of just wanting our churches to get big, what if we decide we want to save as many as possible? And we love the big church. I, we're super grateful for Chicago as a, as a big church in the Midwest. And 
great relationships, but in it, in a AT is actually extremely supportive of this idea of where is our sweet spot and let's multiply that instead of just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we, we've just said, what if, what if we really plant more ch small churches and multiply that way instead of just getting bigger where your engagement is less and your ability to be family is harder and the bureaucracy, the innovation slows down because you have to, once you have a new idea, you have to run it through 18 committees and three years later, you might try a portion of it or something like that. We, we're very innovative. We try new things all the time. And so the small church becomes like this uh, lab of faith and lab of church building to try different things. And so it's exciting and it's, it's freer. And so we just felt like that described us. And so like, but let's multiply that through this small church leadership um, training committee. And so you were one of the, actually one of the first guys I called. And again, this is a, a thing where you had just finished a book towards small church leaders. I was like, how about we form like a think tank committee where we can really figure work on this and and uh you were just instantly you were like yes let's do it <laughs> and so god's taken it and done amazing things already with you but yeah i'm so grateful for that call i can generous. still remember that phone call and how excited i was thank you for inviting me to participate and that led to the look up conference small church leaders conference which was a lot of fun and i think it's 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 brought about some good fruit, and I think it's going to have even more good things happening in the future. Now, one of the things that I wanted to I want to talk about your new ministry. I mean, as if you're not doing enough, you started a, kind of another ministry beyond the small church. Um, but before we get into that, one of the things that you the the thing that strikes me about you guys is I wouldn't call you guys crankers. You know, um, I wouldn't say that you're like so offended. hard driven cranker. You're definitely not type A personality people um, that, you know, at least, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a, I haven't done a personality assessment on you or anything like that. At the same time, your church has grown very consistently year after year, steady growth of 10 to 15% a year since inception and continues to grow, but, but it, it, it almost comes across effortless. And it's, it's kind of like I'm left scratching my head. And I think a lot of people are left scratching their head because they're like, how are they doing that? Like, what, what's going on there? What's going on behind the scenes? Because it seems, it may, you make it seem easy. And can you just share what what what's working for you that's that's produced that consistent year over year growth that that you've seen there in Eau Claire? Uh, well, I'll share for me. I think my convictions have really grown in the fact the Bible says that God wants all men to be saved, and that God is arranging the times and places preparing hearts and I think just being absolutely convinced that God is doing so much work in people's lives and he's the one and it's not necessarily us and my job is just to love people and be a great friend and serve them and watch and just in time God brings the fruit. He brings the open people. So yeah, I mean, in some ways it does seem kind of easy because we are not out cranking. We're just trying to stay close to God, trying to keep in step with the spirit and focused on loving and serving people. And they come out of the woodwork. You know, I was just reading this morning in Leviticus, and this goes a lot to our minister health convictions, but I think that there's a, God makes the church grow. And if you remain in me, me, I'll remain in you and you will bear much fruit, fruit that will last. I think one of the things that 
we believe is that God, the church growing is more of a God gathering his, who, whom he has prepared versus, and then as God gathers, we just try to keep up with the people whom God is revealing are, are open um, versus in a, us um, going and making them come in. And even as I say that, that is literally what Jesus said, go and make them come in. So, <laughs> but there's a, there is a key difference. I think if the leader is pressing and gripping and grinding, then that affects the, the culture of the church. And, but if the leadership is relaxed and there's a, there's a tenor there's a mood of joy and happiness and peace. And if God makes it grow, awesome. Praise God. He gets the glory. If there's a year or so of pruning or amen, we'll respond faithfully. So, so the, I think the pressure's not, we don't, we've learned to not internalize the pressure and because therefore then we pressure people, but more um, be at rest, be at peace, I'm going to, I'm going to work. I'm going to rest. I'm going to take, I'm going to build according to the convictions of the scriptures. God takes care of the results. So focusing more on the process. Sure. There's hard work. Um, it's not like we don't get with people, <laughs> but I think there's a, there's a tenor, there's a culture, there's a vibe that creates intimacy and family uh, whereas there's another vibe that creates a grindy pressing feel in the church. And I don't think that's, that's not attractive to especially people of peace. And okay. so I think partly there's this, I'm going to do well spiritually. I'm going to build my own marriage, my own family and my, my relationships with our, the, you know, our core leaders, that's going to be healthy. And God's bring bring the people of peace, and when the people of peace come, they we just more release them to be influential the way that God made them versus motivate them to push them to, to be that way. Okay, so, so there's, let, a, there's let, a culture that that happens. Let's just, let's just talk about this itself. because this is super. I mean, this is very rare for every person you know that's just like your situation where I, I think there's a lot of people listening. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's what I want. Or that's what I believe. That's what I want to follow, you know, and just focus on, on growing and let it happen. But at the same time, for every situation like yours, there's probably a hundred situations that people are already doing that, but there's no fruit. People are not getting saved. People are stuck in a stagnant situation. They rejected the old cranking model pre 2003. They said, that's right. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to toss that out the window. We're just going to focus on letting, you know, letting go, letting God. And yet it's been years, maybe even decades in some disciples' lives since they've even been in a Bible study. So what's different about what you're doing? Because it sounds, it sounds so attractive, but the fruit is there in your situation. And a lot of people go, yeah, I like that feel, but they're not seeing the fruit. That there's no there's no fruit being born in their lives and their ministry, and it's very if they are honest, they're like, "Hey, it's not working. The people are not getting saved. What's different?" I think every situation is different, so there's not one, you know, answer to solve all those problems. But the one thing that just keeps coming to my mind is how much. Am I loving people? How engaged I am, am I in people's lives? How wide am I? How widely am I engaged in people's lives? How, you know, how deep am I getting with them? And really listening to what's going on in their life and inserting God or my faith into their situation. Um, I think, and again, this is kind of one of the benefits of a small church. I think in the large church, we can get so comfortable 
and have all the friends we need and have our schedules filled with church stuff. And that really limits our ability to engage with the lost. Um, so we're, we're our schedules are full. Obviously, it's a little different with COVID, but out in the community, involved in our kids' stuff, spending time with non-Christians in the neighborhood, um, being really engaged, I guess, would be one thing I would share. Okay. Well, why don't you guys think about that? And, and you know, I think it's an important question because I think whether you're in a large church or a small church, you get into middle age and you can get filled up with the relationships you have already in the church, even if the church is only 40 disciples. There's a lot of churches that are stagnated and they haven't grown. They're not in studies and they're looking going, yeah, I like what, you know, the peds are doing up there, but the key difference is there's no fruit being born in their life. So there's gotta be something different about what you're sharing and what people are experiencing. I, th I think that's some, something worth exploration. But let's get into this waters of, of revival. I'm sorry, waters of rest. Okay. Rest. So anyway, you guys are planting churches. You're raising kids. You're bearing fruit. You're working. You know, you're, you're, you're teaching. I know you teach exercise classes and have done that. And you're helping other small churches. Tell us a little bit about this Waters of Rest ministry and what do you guys do to keep your sanity? I mean, you've already, you're adding another child into your home. You, you mentioned this at the very beginning, how you guys went on a retreat that led you to Eau Claire. So this is obviously not something that's just a recent thing. What are you guys doing in your, in your personal spiritual practice to find rest? Well, um, you know, I think it, let me speak to a little bit to what your your question earlier is. Um, well, actually, no, we'll come. I'll I'll follow your lead. I'm sorry. Okay. We'll, we'll talk That's waters right. of rest. Um, well, I think not to oversimplify, but we believe long term a church's health is going to be emanate from a, the leader's personal health, as well as limited by their own uh, health, and so we have found the most conducive way to, to be healthy ourselves is to make sure that we're living in rhythm. And Jesus, waters of rest comes from Psalm 23, is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me to green pastures. He makes me lie down by still waters. So the original, the Hebrew, instead of still waters, waters of rest. And so, so it's, a, it's an image of Jesus helping us stop, helping us cease, helping us enjoy him and enjoy life and, and rest. Um, and so the rhythms of Sabbath, retreats, sabbaticals, this, this idea in the scriptures of rhythm, there's a time to work and there's a time to rest is, is huge and it's not just a once a week Sabbath day or once every seven years sabbatical. It's really more of a um, way of doing life where the Jews said that it's what kept, you know, the idea of the Jews keeping the Sabbath for 3,500 years, they would say the Sabbath kept us. And so we are a witness to the kind of, health, mental health, emotional health, marital health, family health, and then church health that that uh, um, living in rhythm produces. Um, so, you know, for example, I'm trying to help uh, ministers take sabbaticals. I'm an advocate for that. I'm on the Minister Health Task Force Committee with their, led by Darren Overstreet. And uh, many counselors, many professors, it's a, it's a great group. Just actually, I think there's like two ministers and all these other mental health profess professionals. Um, but the sabbatical is one of the first things we want to try to accomplish and try to help our, our churches have a history of being workaholics, number one. Uh, I, I got through college on about three hours of sleep a night, and it was just 
the first part of our marriage, I remember it was like 4th of July and let's do something like there's no holidays in the kingdom. Like we need to go share our faith. Like I, I was, I come from a workaholic uh, type background and, but I also come from a background where I saw a minister's family's health disintegrate. My own, my own parents, my dad was a preacher and yet I, I saw the effect of being in a role, but not really being deeply um, healthy. And that was devastating to our family. It was just devastating to the, to the church that he uh, ministered at. And so I think that um, sabbaticals, Sabbath rest, being in a, being in a rhythm, even, even on a weekly basis, we try to not do ministry more than three nights a week. And we train our younger staff um, three nights of ministry a week is what we aim at. The rest of the time, you should be cuddling with your kids, hanging out, watching TV, going to bed early. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, most, most of my ministry work happens in the morning and in the daytime. And I'll have, like I said, I have some evening appointments. And I do evening stuff when I need to, but I'm pretty careful with how much I'm away from home. It creates a lot of security in the kids to cuddle with mom and dad uh, before they go to bed and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that this all this comes from the conviction that my first job is to be close to God as a minister and then be close to my wife and have a, a marriage that's healthy and vibrant and then to be close to my kids and then be close to our core leaders. And so it also creates a lack of codependency in the church because I'm just not available any moment when the church expects me to be available, that they've grown accustomed that I'm available to them. Uh, if they want to set up an appointment, then we can get, we can have an appointment, but uh, outside of a, an emergency or a crisis, uh, I'm just not always 24 seven available. And that actually creates a lot of security for them uh, because they learn how to walk with God and, and depend on God and each other uh, for the most part. And then I'm left more as a, um, in case of emergency resource. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's just talk a little bit. That That's a, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's powerful stuff. Um, I think with COVID, there's a lot of um, increase in, in depression and pressure, anxiety, lack of boundaries. People are busy. People are at home. Um, what advice would you give for people that maybe aren't in the ministry and are listening to that and goes, that sounds great. I'd love to take a day off, but man, I'm, I'm working all the time. I'm working at home. I, I don't know how to break away. Like where, where does it start? Like where, if, if you're not in the habit of this and you're not in rhythm, as you say, where do you start? Like give, give us a baby step of, of getting your life under control and getting this kind of peaceful, easy feeling that you guys are, you know, radiating <laughs> straight out of the Eagles right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to share? Yeah, I have a I have a couple of thoughts that maybe will lead to a baby step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it, I think it's a deeper root issue of um, who are you listening to as far as how you run your life. Are you listening to your own inner critic? Are you listening to the people in your life that might be critical? Um, or your own performance driven self or faithless. So I think, I guess the baby step would be to just take even one day a week where you have like extended solitude to be still and listen to God and examine your life and where you're at and how you're doing and um, get in touch with, okay, well, are there limits that God wants me to put on my life and in this season of life are there are there changes I need to make um, do I really trust that every disciple 
has the Holy Spirit and I don't, and I'm not it, <laughs> that um, I can entrust other people to do things. We can spread out the work or we trust that people have their own walk with God and I don't need to be in there every step of the way. Um, and so I think the baby step, like I said, would even just take one chunk of time a week to really wrestle through what is driving me? Why am I living out this schedule that I'm living out? Are there things I can delegate? Are there things I need to say no to? Um, once a week, I take from the time the kids go to school till when they get home out in solitude. Okay, and so let's talk, what do, you, what do you mean solitude? Like, what do you go up in the woods? I mean, what are you doing? What does that mean to you? Yep. I give my phone to Joel because there are certain things, I think, especially as moms that we need to be available for. Um, with my elderly father, I need to be available all the time. And so Joel takes my phone and takes that for me. I have a smartphone that only he has a number to if there track were an phone. emergency, or I'm sorry, a track phone, a dumb phone, not a smartphone. <laughs> is it, is that's a burner? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I go out in nature there's all kinds of different places i've gone to whether you know but it has to be away from people in solitude away from my phone away from technology and and what do you do what, what, like what do you do like you like go for a walk i mean like what are you doing out there yeah um i usually start <laughs> by going for a long walk um, just sitting and looking at creation and nature, God always shows really cool things that help me connect with him and see him in a different way, a bigger way. Um, I read large chunks of the Bible. I'll bring some books along, spiritual books to help me kind of jumpstart an area that I'm working on or wrestling with or thinking about. I journal. Work on your puzzle. Um, I'll work on a puzzle. <laughs> Take a nap. Take a nap. Okay. Yeah, the pressure's the pressure's got to be off that time. You can't you can't force intimacy. It's like a marriage, but you can create a space for it. And I think that's what we encourage people when we talk about this. Who have full time jobs, who have kids at home, is just start. Even if you start with a time on a Saturday morning, that's two or three times your normal quiet time. So if you have an hour quiet time a day, try to take a three hour chunk. Or if you have a half hour quiet time, try to take a, you know, hour and a half to two hour chunk and just car carve it out. And if you determine you're going to do that, then you get resourceful. It's like, okay, if well, I do that, then so-and-so has got to watch the kids or so-and-so has it. And you find that God provides those ways. So one of the biggest things we do is we take a date every week by ourselves. So when you take in a four-year-old basically uh, from a horrible situation um we're like crying out like how are we going to do this well then god provides this single amazing babysitter who's interested in foster care and it's just a, just a gift so i think i think when you when you believe much like the sabbath the jews struggled with the sabbath by you know taking in the manna and you know storing more because they were had the scarcity of fear when you carve out time, so I'm just going to start with something, then God, if you create the space, God will fill it. And I believe God will create the, the resources for you to make it happen. Okay. And, so uh, because he wants that, he wants that more than anything. So I think just starting somewhere. Right. That, uh, that's really powerful because, you know, what I see in you guys is, your ministry is growing and growing consistently, but at the same time, you guys have developed a ministry philosophy that includes taking times of rest. But as you know, there, there, we've got disciples that have shared at the at the conference that we are a part of. Hey, I haven't taken a vacation in in years, let alone a Sabbath day, um, and it, it's really challenging. And I think there's an anxiety there. It's like, oh my gosh, if I go do that. My ministry is going to do worse than than it has been. It hasn't been doing great, and it it's right. a it's a scary. Even though it seems, on one sense, easy, just take a day off. It's also very frightening, 
And how right. do you, how do you still that voice of anxiety that says, Oh my gosh, you can't do this. Or people are going to think you're lazy or, or you're going to get criticized or, you know, what happens if something happens with the kids and any of that kind of stuff. How do you just kind of put that to rest and just trust? I think it goes back to, we have emphasized faith in our walk with God. We've emphasized the obedience aspect of faith and rightfully so obedience is it, but there's another part of faith and that's reliance. And so I think there's a rel- there is a willingness to rely mm. on God. And if you look at the first, the first Sabbath principles, the need to gather that manna out of that anxiety. Um, It just went rotten and God was training them to trust. Mm. And so the few that tried to trust, it didn't go rotten and they had enough. And that's what that's. So it goes back to um, there's a step of risk that you have to take. And we often apply it to our step of obedience someone who's struggling to get baptized, we say, you know what? God commands it. You, you do it. It's a, it's a step out of the boat. And I think Sabbath and getting these rhythms in your life, it's a step of risk. But if you, if you refuse to take that step, things just keep going rotten. Okay. <laughs> mental health is rotten. Our marriage is, you know, the church is now we got a culture of codependence. So minister health is, is, you, you can't build a healthy church if you don't have healthy boundaries and healthy uh, interdependence instead of codependence. And so codependence is a uh, clergy burnout is a book that was recommended to me by um, Jung, Jung oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in uh, Dave, Dave Jung. In Winnipeg, David Jung. Mm-hmm. He said, I said, what's your, what's your best uh, book on minister health? He said, clergy burnout. And it was all about how churches have this codependent culture. And I heard first heard Scott uh, Green talk about ind- interdependence uh, a long time ago, not independence and not codependent, but interdependent. And that really stuck with me in the conviction is that each disciple really does have what they need to do well. And so when I become that resource, instead of become resourceful, then it creates a culture of dependence. So now our church relies on the next push to go evangelize, or they rely on my next meeting with them to feel better about their problems. And instead of this, um, so so I think it really does build on itself. And that's part of what I talked about. When we planted the church, we were convinced that a codependent humanistic culture, we've seen what that does. And this, that was part of the Henry Crete blowout letter was, and so let's, what would it look like to build an interdependent, prayerful, um, spiritual in, in prayer? And then Sabbath has been the biggest thing that God has revealed to us is this is one of the, these are a couple of things that it's going to look like. Um, so I think I said a lot to say, just take a little step, yeah. rely on God and see how it works for you. Okay. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pretty much guarantee God will meet you and do way more than you even thought possible to your, to your mental, emotional health. And you'll find that your family still goes, still going fine and your church still going fine. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the sabbatical. Um, when I hear that, I got to be honest with you, Joel and Christy, I translate sabbatical for ministers as pre-firing. Basically, you get six months before you're going to get canned by the elders. And so it doesn't have a great reputation in my mind. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think that's one of the biggest uh, misnomers that we've run into so far um, in the ICOC is sabbatical has been used more as a probationary tool in the past. And it, it, it really is not intended to be that. <laughs> um, a sabbatical is, is a biblical principle of rhythm. There's a time to work. There's a time to rest. And you see 
that the land was given a sabbatical a year off every seven years and when the israelites violated that um over time god was very upset and he sent them to babylon and if you study just studying this morning leviticus 26 and then chronicles that when god was let the land have its sabbath rest and would not bring the Israelites back until that rest was honored, which they had violated. <laughs> so clearly it feels very strong about it. So, so anyways, it's just principles, but even the world has, has adopted sabbaticals. There's uh, now it's up to about 25% of fortune 100 companies are making their employees go on sabbaticals. Uh, every, you know, and every company's policy is a little different, but the wisdom from the scripture is being more used in worldly companies than in the church mm -hmm. to help its leaders. And it doesn't just have to be ministers, help its leaders find the incredible renewal that a sabbatical brings. And it's not just benefiting to the minister, it's, it helps the whole congregation. It's an incredible blessing to the whole congregation, and I could go into more of that. Yeah. But okay. it, we're finding the we're finding its wisdom being used all over the place, and I think we need to use it in the ICOC. That's great. Now, can you tell me about what are your personal practices? What's working for you? What do you do to stay fired up and refreshed? Well, it's a constantly shifting thing depending on the season of my life. And we're, we've just entered obviously a new season with taking in a four-year-old. And I'm, I feel like I'm starting to settle in to what that rhythm might be. For me, like I shared, I take one day a week where I go out in solitude for anywhere from like five to eight hours. And that is really a time just of listening to God, resting in God, connecting, noticing God, um, sorting through my heart, reading scripture. So that is that time. And then I'm trying to, because I really feel like it's important for our kids to experience it as well. And so this is a change I've made where I am also trying now on Sunday to not have work. Um, and what I mean by that is like, we go to church, we, we are meeting in person in our, um, city. So we do go to church and I try to have like the food prepared ahead of time and have it something simple that isn't, you know, a huge cleanup so that we can just be together. We'll have friends over, the kids have a friend over, or we'll have a family over to eat outside, um, watch a, the football game together, and then we'll play a family game later that night, have a great time just talking and connecting. Go for a walk. Go for a walk together as a family. Um, but really trying to create a day where we enjoy each other and enjoy our relationships and enjoy God. Without, have fun. Yeah, without meetings, without work, et cetera. That's awesome. That's great. My, my, mine looks a little bit different. Um, and this is one of the things we've learned is we can be different and it's, it's okay. Um, but I take um, uh, one, once a day, once a week, I have Sabbath day. <laughs> Not once a day. <laughs> But uh, it's, it, Sabbath in, implies work. So some, I did this lesson uh, for, who was it for? Oh, the small church leaders. And one of the guys that I'm training in the ministry is, there's all these questions about rest. He says, but you don't have a Sabbath day without six days of busting your tail. <laughs> and so, um, so there's hard work implied. It's not about being lazy at all. And so, but to carve out one day, so I turn my phone off. I get the track phone. Uh, I go off to the wilderness. Uh, I go for long walks. I uh, read extended amounts of times in the Bible, but I usually start with Isaiah 40 because for some reason that really connects and brings perspective and just meditate and read out loud, read 
you know, talk to God about Isaiah 40 through 42. Um, the other day I walked six miles uh, just to, and after a while walking, you just, you just, the goal is kind of just to, to let your mind spin out and get lost. It's a get lost type feeling where you don't even realize like, oh my goodness, I've just walked here for, you know, over an hour and I haven't even thought about walking for an hour. And so that's when there's great communication with God and just talking as a friend talks to a friend. Um, so I ordered, I, but part of Sabbath is really enjoying not just not working and not just being extended quiet time type stuff, but really enjoying the, the time. And that's where it says God wanted the land to enjoy its rest. And there's just letting yourself do things that you enjoy. So I'll golf, I'll, there's hobbies. Christy does her puzzles. Um, I just ordered uh, Nacho Libre, Napoleon Dynamite, Back to the Future. Like I've got about four or five movies that I just enjoy. They just make me laugh. And they, it just does so much, actually so much good for my heart and mental health just to you know, why have you not been baptized, you know, and <laughs> praise the Lord, and just uh, uh, all those, like, even now, we're, this is so good for our mental health, you're laughing, we're relaxed, and it's amazing, then, when you do meet with people, and you're doing the work, how much different it is, because mm -hmm. you're not grinding, you're not, uh, you know, it's peaceful, and yeah, so, that's anyways, awesome. Um, but then you take off some time vacation. through the year. Isn't that right? You. Yes. And then twice a year, I take about five days of uh, personal retreats of solitude. Solitude and silence are, are big spiritual disciplines that we're just scratching the surface, I think, in our fellowship of the incredible value. We've emphasized Bible study and prayer, but fasting, solitude, silence um, are just, there's amazing refreshment that goes on. I'm, I'm naturally a, an extrovert. I love being around people. Uh, but I've, I've become more and more kind of an introvert where I, just, I can't wait to be alone. Can't wait to rest with God and talk and think and meditate. And so I've kind of come to this middle spot where actually I love being with people. And then I love being alone and uh, having that Kind of a sweet spot it's like when you're golf or you play tennis and you hit it in the sweet spot there's just a, a feeling that's like ooh, like like i just can't wait to do that again that's awesome um and serving god can often not be in the sweet spot right and that's where jesus says, come to me all who are weary burdened i'll give you take my yoke upon you i'll give you rest for okay. your soul <clears throat> And Thank so you. that you can find that sweet spot with balance. Well, what you're sharing is super attractive. What, where would people go if they wanted to get more information about this, this ministry, this service you're providing, Waters of Rest? How would they find you? Well, I'm, I'm really working with a number of ministers and their boards and their core groups because a minister can't just do a sabbatical on his own. He needs the support <laughs> of the whole church and how that's communicated is really important and so we're work i'm doing research and i'm working with boards so email me for and i want to provide the whole goal of waters of rest is to provide research and resource so there's so much we need to learn about this i think none of us really know what we're talking about yet so i'm trying to devote myself to learning and then to resource so to to be a be a coach um, be a resource for boards and core leadership groups, helping develop sabbatical policies. So just contacting me, joelpete at charter.net. Um, I will be uh, launching a, starting with a Facebook group where I'm going to be answer. I'm going to be doing short videos, just short, simple Facebook live videos. And it's going to be based on what questions people have. So the question of, well, I don't get a sabbatical. Why should my minister get one? I'm just going to take about two or three minutes to an answer that question. Well, what difference does it make for the whole church, not just the minister? I'll take two minutes to answer. So just comment, you know, like 
frequently asked questions, quick answers to those um, as a start. Eventually, it should be a, a, a sabbatical manual and then uh, a book that we want to write together. Sounds like you guys have a book that's going to be a great one. I, I know that. Now, Christy, can we, do you mind if we just go back? Because I think you're such a great mother and great support to Joel. And you guys are such an awesome couple. You got a great marriage. I mean, there's so many, you know, wow, you really have it together in my mind. You're planning churches, you're raising kids. You've got three older kids who are disciples who are, and you now adopted a four-year-old. I go, oh my gosh. Any advice for those who want to do ministry with kids? What they, get, they look at that, they look at what you're doing, they're like, wow, that's inspiring and also challenging. What, what advice would you give them? I think it is first and foremost, first and foremost, to have an awesome walk with God, to live out your dream. Um, I think about when we, when we talk about, you know, what we did with planning the church and, you know, I, I so often hear people say, well, I don't want to do this or that because what about our kids? And I'm like, okay, that's probably one of the big reasons you should do this or that <laughs> because the greatest way to impact our kids is when our walk with God is vibrant Man. and we're walking up by faith and doing an experience. Like yeah. That. They, they see God working. Um, and there was, there were no kids on our mission team. <laughs> there was no youth and family ministry. There was no guarantee of a great teen ministry when we planted this church and yet our kids all became disciples. We grew a great youth and family ministry. They love the church. Um, I just, I think I we, Jackson. yeah, we can't let fear for how this will affect our kids stop us from living out God's dream for our life. So I think that's so important. Um, a cool example is our oldest son, when deciding where to go to college, he's absolutely set on Duluth. And we were kind of like, well, do you want to check out other schools or what? You know, why? Because there's, you know, 20 people. And finally, he's like, I want to go there because I want to help the campus ministry. I want to help build it. And we're like, okay, yep. You, know, <laughs> like, you want to go somewhere where there's bigger campus ministry, you know, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, so he, we were convicted by his conviction. Um, but it's so cool. He is bringing visitors. He's in a Bible study, um, doing, leading the devotionals there, you know, super encouraging to see the fruit of, um, hopefully the example we set. <laughs> so I think the other thing is have an awesome marriage. Um, absolutely prioritize your marriage. Marriage first. Um, yeah, kids cannot be the center of the family and, and ministry is not the center. We have a daily, we have a weekly date and like Joel shared, that was one of the first things we did when we, when God gave us a child to a four-year-old now we need a babysitter again <laughs> and we go every week. In fact, we have extended our weekly time or our date night to, it goes about eight hours, our weekly date. <laughs> Um, because that's what we need. It is high stress on our marriage, uh, bringing in a child from trauma, from a trauma situation. And that's just what we need right now to stay close and do well. Wow. So we do that every week without fail so far. <laughs> um, I think too, um, it's interesting uh, about the kids thing. We we feel like planting the church was the best thing for the kids in their faith. Yep. And you just hear too often um, people not listening to the call of God because they're afraid it's going to affect their marriage or family. And even when we planted the church, I remember feeling so close to you and it was yep. one of the best things for our marriage. 
And then it's interesting when we were wrestling with, should we take in this four-year-old? One of the biggest things the kids, the two younger kids felt like was, what's going to happen to our family nights? What's going to, he's like, we don't want to lose what we have with our family nights. What's going to happen to our family? And Jackson, our oldest, was there. And he looks at them and says, what's going to happen to our family if we say no to this? Mm. And we were, I was just like, sit back and <laughs> let him decide. <laughs> and so he's like, we don't have a choice. This is, and so it was just, it's just really, I think, having a strong family in whatever it takes pumping into that as your priority is really, really huge. I want to give you a few practicals, Rob. You asked about ministry with kids. I think it's important for starting with dad, get up early and be in that quiet time. So when those kids get up, they come out and they find you and you're having your quiet time. This morning, I had our four-year-old foster daughter and my 15-year-old teenage daughter both sitting in my lap at the same time. And <clears throat> sorry. And um, that's how they absorb the faith, just because they see it and they feel it. Mm -hmm. And um, already the four year old, four year old's teacher came to me two days ago and said, Jayana, told us about how you're teaching her to have a quiet time. <laughs> <laughs> so Jana has her Bible and her journal and she doesn't even know how to write, but she's having quiet times that she's sharing about with her teacher. Amen. So <laughs> I think it starts with there and then weekly. I think love is spelled T I M E with your kids. Mm. Uh, we have a date night. We have a family night, special times with the kids each individually and not doing ministry more than three nights a week, and then annually spiritual retreats. But then each of my kids, we had special things we would do. Like we would go to the Minnesota Wild playoff game or the Minnesota Vikings game, just special one-on-one. -on -one. The last time, Rob, you and I met in Denver with Joel Nagel, I brought Carter with. It was a special one-on-one -on -one trip. Took care of some business with Rob Skinner and Joel Nagel. And then we went off for a little ski a couple days. Mm -hmm. And um, those kind of one-on-one -on -one memories with each of the kids, it's golden. Wow. And they know how busy we are. They, they get it. And so when we carve out the time to be with them, um, it's, wow. it's beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing. And I, I love your heart, Joel. You're, you're a sensitive person and... Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, I, I love that. And I, I think that's one of the things that, you know, impresses me about you. You're, you're so loving, so caring, and that love really radiates. Um, any final words for those listening? People want to make a difference with their lives, live a no regrets life. Uh, you guys are certainly living that out and you're living it under your own terms, which is awesome. I would say, well, first of all, Rob, thank you so much for doing this podcast i continuously hear about it from all over the place you're doing a great work yourself and for it's a really honor to so i would say um, don't allow human limitations either yours or others to stop you from answering god's call mm -hmm. whatever it may be um, go on a church plant do it go to flagstaff mm -hmm. it's <laughs> uh, we got some come to duluth uh come to Eau Claire, we'll train you and send you out. Amen. Um, I would say small church leaders, right? Join join our webinar, join our network. There's yep. something really special happening yep. with the small church leaders. It's not it's not our idea, it's not our thing. We just God is doing something um magical. And if you're a minister or a Christian leader that has not had a sabbatical and you've been serving longer, then I would say. 10 years in the ministry, please contact me. Mm -hmm. There's incredible springs of revival and renewal that you can tap into that you don't really realize how much you need it and you can't wait till it's too late. Mm -hmm. So please contact myself. We can really help your whole church um, and your whole family receive this, this blessing of Sabbath rest. Mm -hmm. I think 
for the sisters, I would, the biggest thing I would say is keep your priorities straight. Um, be so close to God and hearing him, answering his call. And I think just believe that he can do great things, even through your small offering. That's awesome. Wow. Thank you guys so much. I love you guys so much. It's just, it's a blessing to be able to work with you guys. Um, it's interesting how I remember when you gave me the call, Joel, and, and you called me about 10 years prior to that when you're planting the church, or, you know, and, and I think I met you in Minnesota probably five years before that, but God has allowed our paths to cross. And um, I mean, we're different in some significant ways and yet very similar in terms of our love for the kingdom and Amen. passion. And I think God uses those different gifts in, in different ways, but uh, you know, I don't know anyone I respect more in the kingdom. You guys, both you guys are really an impressive couple. So thanks for joining me today. And I want to say thank you for listening to the Rob Skinner podcast. It's great to have you here every week listening in. And thank you so much for all the support and the feedback that I've been receiving for sharing this with your friends. If you're enjoying this, just let people know. Hit the subscribe button. Let your friends and family know about it. My goal is to inspire you to make this life count, live a no regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.